in this 13th part of the multiplayer series, let's hope it doesn't bring bad luck, we're going to have a look at extrapolation when you don't have a future state to interpolate to. In the last episode, we had a look at interpolation and how by rendering 100 milliseconds in the past, we get both a past and future world state between which we can interpolate and smooth out the movement in our multiplayer games. Now this assumes that the internet is on our side, but the internet doesn't always abide by our will and there can be situations, a hanging connection or several packets lost in a row, in which case you actually don't have a future world state even though you were rendering in the past. That situation looks a little bit like this. We rendered 100 milliseconds in the past, indicated by the green. We need to render the world at 10185, but we've only received world packets up to 1015, only the packets in the past. Now, interpolation doesn't work anymore at this point because we don't have a future world state. What we can do is extrapolation, and that's what this tutorial is about. With extrapolation, we take the two latest world states, which of course are both going to be in the past. These two world states contain enough data for us to calculate both the rotation and speed of every single entity that are in those world states, NPCs, mobs, players, you name it. Now, with that speed and rotation, we can then compare the time between those two world states with the time between the render time and the latest world state to do an estimated calculation where all those entities are going to end up if they kept moving in the same direction. Now, of course, that's a big assumption right there that everything keeps moving in the same direction. And of course, we're going to create small deviations if players, mobs or NPCs made turns during those couple of milliseconds. However, as future world states are going to keep coming in from the server, we are slowly adjusting all those movements. And as soon as we have a future packet again, we immediately fix everything and we're back on track. This way the movement keeps smooth and the player doesn't experience the lag spike that he would otherwise experience. Now, with that said, let's code it into the game. There's only a couple of small changes that we have to make and add a couple of lines, so this will be a short tutorial and you'll be back working on your project in no time. The first line I want you to focus on, this line right here, is actually not code, this is the expected outcome of the world state buffer before we start interpolating. I've shown you this in the previous tutorial on interpolation. So we have these two lines right here and these two lines make sure that the world state buffer which collects all the uh, world states that the player receives is going to have the same format so that when we are interpolating all these uh, buffer references are always going to be the correct states that we need to be referencing in order for that movement to stay smooth. Now, as I've shown you in the previous tutorial, the outcome or the expected outcome is past world state, future world state, future, further in the future world states. However, I've just shown you that for extrapolation, what we're coding in this tutorial, we need two past world states and the current code doesn't allow or accommodate that. So we need to change the, um, the code, the existing code of the interpolation functions to account for also a past past world state. So, with that deleted, you understand the concept of the changes that we're going to be making. Or actually, that I've already made. I'll go over what those changes exactly are. They start on line 34. Before, we were referring, uh, referencing index number one in the world state buffer because that will be the second index in the array and we wanted the second index to be the future world state. But now we want the third index to be the future world state. So I've upgraded this from a one to a two. That also means that in all the rest of the code, we have to make sure that we up all the world state index references up by one. So this used to be zero, this used to be a one, this used to be a one, and this used to be a zero, used to be a zero, used to be a one, used to be a one. So you have to upgrade all those index references with one to make sure that the interpolation function still works the same, even though we have an extra past world state in the world state buffer. Now, with that said, we have an extra line of code here on uh, line number 36, and that is a new line of code. We're going to be checking on top of the code from the previous tutorial if the world state buffer size is bigger than 2. Because if it's bigger than 2, that must have meant that the render time was not bigger than world state buffer 2, because this delete has not um, triggered. So. If we have more than two in the world state buffer, it means we have three. If we have three, it means we have a future world state. If we have a future world state, we want to be interpolating. However, 
if we are not having more than two, so we have two or less, that is the moment that we can determine whether we need to extrapolate or not. There's only going to be one situation in which we do not want to extrapolate, and that is if the render time is bigger than the world state buffer timestamp on array index number one. This is the case when a player logs in for the first time. The first world states are received. Those are all future world states, but the buffer is not big enough for us to start trimming because we don't simply hit the uh, while we'll say buffer size is bigger than two yet. So to make sure that we're not going to be extrapolating future world state, which we shouldn't be extrapolating at all, we are going to make sure that the render time is bigger than the world state buffer one timestamp. And only then we know that we have two uh, past world states loaded into the buffer and apparently not a third world state in the future, because otherwise this line of code would have hit. So now that we know that we need to extrapolate, code looks pretty similar to the interpolation part. We again have an interpolation factor and an extrapolation factor. We are going to go over all the players in which we do a couple of checks to make sure that we don't have to exclude anything. Exactly the same as here. We again make sure that that node is available uh, among the nodes on the map so that that player is already known. We define a new position and we push that towards the player, which we do right here. The only difference is that the extrapolation uh, factor is a slightly different uh, calculation and we also have this position delta right here that we need to calculate because we cannot lerp because we don't have enough data to lerp. So let's start with the differences. We start with the extrapolation factor. The extrapolation factor is exactly the same function as the interpolation factor. The only difference is that we deduct one at the end. We do that because we do not want to include the time that has passed between both past world states as that time has already been accounted for. Then what we also do with the position delta is we take the position of the past world state and we deduct it with the position in the past past world state. Then the new position is going to be the latest known position that we know is, to, is true, which would be the uh, player position in world state number one, that is the most recent past. And then we add the position delta multiplied by the extrapolation factor and push that to the move player. Now, regretfully, I cannot demonstrate to you how this works in this project because I cannot determine when a packet is lost. That's what the internet decides. I can, however, show you in a separate script how this function works so you can better conceptualize it, understand it, and understand how your own game is going to work. After I've done that demonstration, I'll also fix the new spawn new player function we got right here, as that has basically broken since we are now buffering or buffering, yeah, buffering and uh, rendering 100 milliseconds in the past. So let's first really quickly go over that other script. Here I have two states or two dummy states and a future render time. So we have two positions of a past past world state and the past world state, the two timestamps that accompany those uh, two states. And we have a render time, 25 milliseconds further in the future than the latest world state that we have received. Here we have that extrapolation factor, position delta and new position, exactly the same variable names as you just saw on the real project on the code. Here also we're putting that minus one in here. So if I play this, you can see how this is actually going to work for us. Now zoom in a little bit. I can just close this. I'll zoom in a little bit on the, the button there. So the extrapolation factor is basically expected to be 0 0.5 as it shows there because we have 25 milliseconds since the latest world state, but the time between the two world states of the past are 50 milliseconds. So that means that whatever delta happened between those two timestamps, we have to multiply it by 0 0.5 in order to get the right position. So that's how you see that extrapolation factor work. And the position delta is, of course, going to be a vector 50 by 50. That's not really magic. The new position is the old position. So that will be 150 by 150 with the difference in position multiplied by that extrapolation factor, which, of course, would become a vector zero, uh, 25 by 25. Now add the two together. And now the player is going to be rendered at 175, 175, exactly where we would expect him to be if he were keep moving with the same speed in the same direction. So that's how that works. Now let's quickly go back to that spawn new player, make sure that it's fixed. There's one line of code and I'll leave you to it. 
So we're back on the project to fix that spawn player or despawn player, I should say. The problem we having with the current code is this line right here. What happens is because we are rendering 100 milliseconds in the past, the moment a disconnecting player is signaled to the other players to despawn that player among the other players that are still in the game, the um, interpolation function hasn't finished processing all future world states, some of which will still contain a player state of that player that has just disconnected. And because of that, the code is simply going to recognize, hey, I don't have that player, so he must be new. That's how the code interprets it. And he spawns a new player, even though that is actually a disconnected player. Um, so you see the player disappear for a couple of milliseconds and then reappear again. That's, of course, not what we want. So. Quick fix for this is simply in the despawn function we got on the top here to yield for 200 milliseconds. That way all the future states that still have to be processed that that player might still be in are all in the past. We don't have those anymore and the function can continue as normal player states despawned. Now I would suggest this method only for crashed players. For normal logging off players, what I would advise, as with most MMORPGs, that you implement a 5 or 10 second timer. If the player moves or does any action during the timer, the disconnecting timer automatically stops again. And while that timer is running, to turn off the physics process engine for that player so it doesn't st continue to send any packets anymore. And as it's not sending any packets, when that player has gracefully logged off, there's no a future player states um, that the other players still have to process so that respawn doesn't happen either. That would be the, let's say, the clean, the right way to disconnect a player. I'm not going to demonstrate to you as I don't have a whole game menu and all the other stuff, um, but it's something that's pretty easy to implement and you can keep this line of code for crash players. That was it for today, guys. Hope you like it. If you did, smash that like button, hit subscribe. Don't forget that little bell icon to make sure that you don't miss out on the next tutorial in this multiplayer series. Now, pretty much we have all our movements now coded into the server and the client. And I think the next big challenge for our multiplayer series is how we can make sure that things entities, NPCs and mobs don't live client side, but actually live server side. I've shown you, demonstrated to you in a, in a previous tutorial that the, both players that we are connecting can still independently from each other kill the wear bear that's on the map. But of course, if one player kills it, we would want it to see that as well for the other player. And the damage that one player does should also count for the health bar that the other player sees on that wear bear um, to make sure that you know things are multiplayer and not sort of weird dimensional single player while you see each other. So that's pretty much going to be up for the next couple of tutorials. We'll probably have to spend two or three on that. And I think that is going to be uh, becoming pretty close to concluding this entire series. So pretty excited to finish this all up. I hope you are too. See you in the next tutorial. Until then, keep on gaming, keep on coding. See you later, guys.